haven't done it yet. But I'm like, what, do I'm, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to take pictures of? I don't understand. I think I've only like, done it twice before, and I just took pictures. I'm like, these are my albums. Like, here they I are. Think they just want to see that okay. we are making progress. They don't necessarily want to see the content. I think they just want to see that yeah. we're doing it. And then I did it from okay, the side. So thicker. <laughs> it's getting thicker. Okay. <laughs> Well, because I wonder, I don't because know. I was like, when Dabika came, she did look at my albums. Like, oh, they okay, exist. Good. I oh, am putting stuff in them, I guess. Yeah. So I have a question about albums. Um, do you guys have, like, nine albums, or do you have, like, a couple? I have three. Okay. I think I have three. That's a substantial amount of them, because I feel like I have to break them, because there's so much information, I have to break them down into binders that kind of, like, correlate with each other like I have a development and um, observation notebook and then I've got you know my uh, herb album then I have like a practical life album and in the process of making my language album so are we supposed to have multiples I so you can do it however you you yeah. can do it however you want they said <laughs> I I was like nice. when I set mine up I was really unsure of how I would even want to do it so I just went with yeah. what they recommended I have a for the child within the prepared yeah. environment and um, like I think the other one is for the teacher or yeah. spiritual preparation of the teacher or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, and I had found, I had found yesterday there was this other, um, I think it was in the, the green mm. book um, that they, they like had a whole list of recommended articles and things that they suggest having in in albums yeah um so i was looking at that and that was really helpful because i i felt kind of like chaotic about the whole album situation because i i need like explicit instruction in life of like what to do so when yeah. they're like oh just do it however makes sense to you like that was too much freedom yeah. for me so it was nice to have that kind of guideline of things to include and i had included like 80 percent of that stuff so it made me feel like okay i'm on the right track yeah, and I think mm -hmm. somebody directed me over residency to do just do the modules. Like, you know, we I think we have eight modules. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not a bad so idea. They did. Yeah, was, I, well, I, Terry I did. They don't say, that. Yeah, they said. Yes, they Terry that. did specifically say that they don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. But oh. I think she said that just because it might make it difficult to find information when you're taking your final exam. Yeah. Well, I, well, it's I, a spiral sure. curriculum. Yeah. So, so that's actually, um, that makes sense to me is that because we do touch on the subject yeah. areas, um, at different points in the module and it would make the most sense to keep yeah. your, every time we're talking about language, regardless of the arc yeah. of the course that that goes yeah. in your language album and um, well, maybe yeah. I didn't do all the modules because I did like well history and philosophy philosophy then materials I guess then the child and the teacher like what you were saying Laura so maybe yeah. it's not the modules. Yeah. that's what they recommended yeah. and that actually it makes a lot of sense yeah. I think as as we add like a lot of information in regards to um, like specific work areas like language and art and culture and sensorial and practical life, like you might want your own album for each of those things, just because you throughout the years will have so many examples of different materials and so many lesson plans drawn up. But I think yeah. until you get to that point, it, it makes sense the way that they recommended to do it. I'm sure I'll end up revising mine at some point. And I heard from several other people that they changed theirs more than once as they changed themselves. So I guess maybe that. Your manual should be dynamic. Um, they are a starting place and they're going to be your resource throughout your teaching career. Um, that's, I, that's what I think. Um, so you're, yeah. I think that's totally good advice, Laura, um, that every time you go to a training, you know, you get those handouts you know what you do with them? You take them back and you put them in your manual and you file them and incorporate them because we're always like, this is all the beginning. Um, yeah. which is crazy to think, right? Cause it feels like we're pretty in it, <laughs> but it's just the beginning and, um, and you're going to grow and evolve throughout your 
career as an educator and um, every time, and your manuals are kind of like the place where you organize all of that. Um, so they should be dynamic and you should change them and you should let like give some space in your whatever mental capacity to, to, to go outside of them and use your observations because saying it wasn't in my manual or that's not how it is in my manual. That's not a great, you know what I'm saying? Like you gotta yeah. <laughs> do what's right for the children. So well, I, I can't wait to have 18 months to be able to focus on just that. <laughs> my brain is like so stretched. I'm like, I can't even like, we have the transparent classroom software and oh, I good. sort of dabbled in it a little, but, and my, my office manager is like, so you can do this and you can do this. And I was like, listen, lady, I got to get through this course. That's enough and, like, out of you. Keep yeah. The kids, <laughs> keep the kids from like tearing this joint apart. So I just got to keep everybody doing something and get my work done. And next year I'll be on it. But this year it's not happening. <laughs> like I can't, I can't learn new software and do this at the same time. It's just asking a lot of me and I don't like to overstress myself. You know, I like to, I do what I need to do. You know, I observe the kids and I put out materials that they need and like, I'm doing all that. I'm just not exactly documenting it all the time, but I'll get there. I promise. You'll get there. No, it's okay. It's okay. I think that that's um, it's, good to be. It's a huge too. change having done doing this course from what like my understanding is so much deeper and I want to get to the point where I document everything and use the software and whatnot, but whew, it's crazy right now. You'll get there. I think that you have to have the right technology for Transparent Classroom. So one thing, mm -hmm. if you're using Transparent Classroom, you have to have a mobile device, not an iPad, but an i. Like um, Transparent Classroom is only on Apple. So that's convenient for me because I'm only on Apple. But I know that there's a big chunk of the world that operates um, with an Android Well, platform. we have the – we – I mean – I have Transparent Classroom on just my PC. Yeah, but my you, in order to get the um, the photo importing process is very problematic with um, with Transparent okay. Classroom, and so the you can't just like upload photos easily from the cloud or from unless they've changed it. You will have to double check. But we have a um, oh Rashani, hi! Look at your face. It's your face. Finally, I'm not in the car on mute. Yay. Uh -huh. um, so we have iPhones, like old iPhones that are not connected to, they're not, they're just i i devices, right? IPods. Just to like use the Wi-Fi at the um, school and be able and to do things? To take your photos. It's the, like that's, Got it. um, you can't, like it's really not realistic to take photos on one device and then import them. That step is just too yeah. costly in terms of time. So you have to I'm have sure like an iPod. An old iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. Just ask the parents to donate one. Um, it just has to have a working camera and Wi-Fi enabled. And then you can take the pictures and they'll go directly into transparent classroom. And the only prep that you really have to do is tagging them. And once you get used mm -hmm. to what that, what that is, then it goes really fast. So um, oh, that's, good. that's classroom, a good recommendation. Yeah, yeah, it's a good. Um, well, I didn't tool, know that. But uh, but you, ha you have you have to have a device. Um, to take yeah, I don't even know if my office manager knows that. Like, okay, so probably most people have an iPhone except me over here. But yeah, <laughs> so because I well, know that the primary teacher uses transparent classroom for everything, mm -hmm. and she took pictures, and so maybe. But I don't see her. Well, I don't know. I don't really see her take pictures very often. But I'm not in there all day either. So. That's the I best way. It, but. The pictures are the best okay. way. So. Yeah, that's what that's what they tell me. So. Well. Someday. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we got a lot of music this week. Did you guys watch yeah. the videos? <laughs> yeah there oh man it was tough I watched them all and it was really hard like I was like oh my am I supposed to sing with them or what what are we doing here I mean they have lovely voices and the songs are important right but um it really made me think more and more about like how much a singing curriculum is like about um everybody around you singing do you know what I'm saying like all the songs that I know mostly came from 
hearing other people in my school sing and then the ones that I um like incorporated into that came from me really having to kind of work right you gotta put in some effort and listen to some cds and yeah um, and and also so a little oh. you gotta like the songs right so <laughs> And you're gonna like to sing as well. Well, <laughs> well you have yeah. to sing. It's just it's non negotiable. <laughs> sorry. Even, Even if you don't like it, I'm sorry. You. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little a little um thing about singing, just something that I sort of put together, a little bit of an aha moment, we'll say. Uh -huh. So it's it's a combination, two parts. Like the idea of language being such a social thing and how like social areas of the brain light up when language is being spoken it has to be meaningful to learn language and then in combination with music so our cd player is currently down <laughs> at nap time we haven't had any music and it's been a little rocky and today everybody i read stories and i said okay everybody lay down and then i sang them a few songs and there was a noticeable difference in the stillness of their bodies and the calmness in the classroom when I right there with them was singing versus when just the music is playing on the CD player. And I was like, wow, I need to learn some more sleepy time songs because I didn't know enough to keep going. <laughs> but it was, it was really cool how, how calm they all were and just listening and watching me. It was pretty cool. Nice. Does anyone else do that at nap time? Does anyone else sing for the children? <laughs> Not at nap time, no, but I think that's lovely. I think that's such a lovely idea. Um, I I often, oh, hi, Dabika. Oh, Dabika's not feeling so hot. Still? I know. I actually wasn't oh. sure that she would join us. Can you hear us, Dabika? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. I really think that I will be able to join, but I I made it. But I'll be here for some time, and then I'll go back. To it. You made it. Oh, are you not feeling well? Thanks everybody, because this is the last week before the summer. I don't want to miss it, you know. Well, it's just a week. I off. did <laughs> my shoulder, my knee, my ribs, the whole oh. body. I don't know how I did that, but oh. I, I actually, this antibody was making me very weak and it was raining outside, so I shouldn't have gone out. But it's still raining? It's still raining. Oh my gosh. We had sun this morning, but now it's still raining and lightning also at the same time. I want some over here. It's so sunny here. It's like 95 degrees uh -huh. already. Oh. <laughs> We're still so using our sweaters. <laughs> Uh, too bad. How is everybody? Oh, I hear you. Kathy has a, Kathy's trying to say something. Can you, I can't hear you, Kathy. I just had a question about music. Can you hear me? Yeah, now yeah. I can. Does everybody play music throughout the day in the classroom? Have like a little music going? Not the whole I time. I cannot. The whole time. Um, Do you think that's I, I, I we put some on at lunchtime. You put some on at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's reasonable. Music. Sure. Do you play I music find, all the? Oh, Laura, go ahead. I find that when I play music, like during work periods or during any time that we're not, you know, like they haven't asked for me to turn on music, um, it they just try to talk over it. Like it's not a good background hum it's like yeah something that people are trying to go over um especially at lunchtime but i mean it works for some people it just doesn't work for us so we just break out in song when the moment presents itself but yeah. other than that do you have is there music playing in your classroom all the time kathy all the time and yeah over stimulated it's so it loud. is yeah well, and when um, do the children have a chance to um, sing their own songs? You know, if there's always songs in the background, then they can't just spontaneously sing the songs that they want to sing. They can't, no. Um, yeah, our, I have a funny story. 
I have a funny story about two-year-old and singing. Okay. <laughs> um, so being in the oppositional phase um, at stage and, um, and then, you know, their love for music. So I, I had two 24-month-olds uh, sitting in the, um, the library, like the reading piece corner while we were doing music. And they, uh, they chose to be there. And um, one of them was sitting in the rocking chair singing, rain, rain, go away, come again another day, which is one of the songs that we sing in music, but he wanted to be in library. And, um, and then the other child also in the library area started singing and the first child said, no, my rain. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's my rain, I'm singing that song all by myself. It was very funny. <laughs> They're funny. They are so funny. You'll notice when you watch my my presentation of a of a song or whatever in my video. Uh -huh. Um I'm the only one singing. <laughs> because that's what they do to me sometimes. And then my son is sitting next to me singing the ABCs and <laughs> it's not what I'm singing. A totally different song. They, they have yeah, he's singing ABCs and then he gets to P and his dad taught him to say, where's the pee? It's running down my leg. And he thinks that's hysterical. <laughs> and he laughs. And that is you hysterical. Might not catch in the video. That's you might funny. not catch it in the video, but it's there. Oh, he oh. thinks it's the best. So he, he asked me to sing it at school. And I'm just like, buddy, that, we'll sing it at home. Like, I just don't want to teach all the kids. It's <laughs> 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 not care if every parent would appreciate the humor in that. Like, I would, but... <laughs> Yeah, the uh, stuff dads teach their kids, right? And we're just like, thanks, thanks for that. That's funny. Special well, relationship. <laughs> so, how do we um, convince Kathy's administrator or her lead teacher to start playing less music? Like, what do you think? What should we do? Well, I think Kathy should do some observation and make specific <laughs> notes about when she sees it's affecting the children's ability to concentrate, like concrete evidence. But how will you know if it's always playing? Like, how would you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, well, true. I liked what you said, Mercedes, about if there's music playing, are you taking away their opportunity for them to sing their own songs? And I mean, do you think... Well, I that think that that's some, a good pedagogical uh, argument. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Eugenia, and what I did you think? think? That, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that um, some years ago, we did that. We had music like all the time. Playing. Well, not all the time, but during one to three time, which is like uh, three, four hours a day. And we stopped at lunch or snack time. And then there was always music playing. Not necessarily like singing, but just like um, classical music or instrumental music. Uh, but then we stopped and we started to score. Um, I think one of the videos played beautifully, like the power of silence. And I think that's a good way that you can explain it to mm -hmm. an, an administrator. Like how much children can concentrate and value the non power of silence. And... It's been wonderful for us. We have artists with some trees. And it, like right now, our children, they know when the square comes to food because they hear it when, they, when it comes. And they hear the wind and they tell us, teacher, it's going to rain. Uh, and I, that is happening because there's silence. So maybe that's sure. a good thing. I love what it said in Maria Montessori's words yeah. uh, about the power of silence right. in the room. Mm -hmm. Another very good pedagogical argument. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and you can add that to your observation also, that when uh, the director wants you to play the music, let, you know, play the music for a few, sometimes like half an hour and then stop yeah. it and see how it works for 10 minutes. And that can, could be your observation also. Within 10 minutes, what's happening and what is happening for half an hour music like that. And then you can start again, but depends on what kind of music you are playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could I mean, be a song, it could be just a simple, like um, guitar or string music, you know, something classical and yeah. very soft. 
and then you change it during the sleeping time you can do something very soft music you know in the background so change your music and with the gap of silence and that silence period you can actually play different games with the children mm -hmm. Yeah, so that way you can do some observing when we are doing it. It's like an experiment. You do that and observe the children and you re keep record of it. And you can then you can sit down with the director and say, this is what happening. I observe. So what do you want us to do? Keep the children focused on particular activities or you just want them to, you know, just dance with the rhythm of the children. What do you want actually? Ask him. What's the objective? Of yeah, the, yeah that, I was uh, wondering the role, playing yeah. the music. Yeah, there might I think be that's some a good question. Reasoning. She has yeah, some rational behind, behind it. That she wants to play the music the whole time. There must be some rational. So ask her that this is if this is your rational, then we have observed this. Now, what do you think about it? You know, <laughs> what do you think? Put the ball, that's hard put the ball in it's hard for me to understand the idea of playing music constantly because I find it extremely distracting. Like I can't, that's me personally, but like I cannot focus when there's like background noise. I don't know. It's just, even if it's soft, gentle, I don't know. I, I think some people are the opposite too, Laura. Like they, have a hard time focusing when it's too quiet and it might i wonder if it's the teacher that needs the music on i wonder if it's, it's the teacher that needs the music on too, uh, me too. I, I feel I, like I agree with when you. i mean i know there's lots of different learning styles and lots of different personality styles and like i i get it and i respect it but i do have to question if the reason some people find it uncomfortable to sit in silence because they've always had noise like if from well, birth yeah, like there's, think, your parents always played music your toys always made music at you like there was always some background hum like yeah is also, that what also, makes silence uncomfortable yeah well, there, also, some children, you know, sorry there, sorry there, go ahead uh, there, well, there, there are some children where their neurological system is just wired in a way that um, that noises that are not consistent are kind of alerting and alarming to them. So mm -hmm. if they have a consistent noise, um, it's actually less distracting. So I've had children, not in a Montessori classroom, but I've had children that are in inclusion and have to wear headphones that play like a soft music so that there yes. aren't um, noises that are inconsistent in the classroom that are um, distracting to them. So I absolutely agree with your point, Laura, about um, just in general, I think we're all used to sort of overstimulation yeah. um, when we get used to that. But I think there are some children that are just um, neurologically wired where, um, you know, that consistent sound is more soothing than intermittent sounds. Mm. Yeah, I guess that would have to just be a case by case basis. And, yeah. you know, you have but, to. But it shouldn't be what the teacher needs, right? It should be what. Well, the who knows? Needs. Has have they talked to you at all, Kathy? About like, um, you know, like at this time we play this music. Is it the same CD? Yeah. What like what does it look like? So it's it's the same type of music, but um, I just wanted to say this. I wish that I had a classroom that was more authentic Montessori because now I'm at the point where I'm just I'm sad all the time and I'm overwhelmed. Oh, oh no. Because, because oh. What I'm learning is not what I'm I'm able to to do in yeah. the classroom. Right. And I'm, I've been you know, there. I'm being told to hold back and not interrupt what they this is what they've always done when I walk right. in and music. You know, the way that they practice is totally not what I'm learning. So it's making me feel like I'm not making a difference and I'm not able to do what I'm being taught. I'm right. almost actually falling into what they're doing. And I know that is wrong. And so, it's hard to fall into. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I think they think they're doing the right thing by playing the music, but a, because it really makes sense not to have the music on and to put it on at nap time. Mm -hmm. All I hear at nap time is, shh, be quiet, go to sleep, be still oh, yeah. now. 
don't talk, don't move. But they're doing all the talking over the classroom. Right. And the kids are coming straight from lunchtime and simulation to now lay on your cot, don't move, don't talk. Right. And music is still going and they're talking. And I'm just so frustrated. I'm just yeah. really frustrated now. And I'm Are there phones out at nap time? Cell phones? Are teachers on their cell phones at nap time? No, the teachers are just talking. They're, they're, they're just, just talking. Oh, okay. Talking across the room. So it's just, it's no peace in the room, really. And yeah. the children don't know how to self-regulate because they're being told, no, don't do this. Don't climb. Don't bend over. Don't move. No, no, no. And I'm just, I'm just frustrated. And, I, and I'm really sorry I'm sounding off like this, but I am so frustrated. Yeah. No, somewhere it's been a somewhere tough... you have to let it out. Otherwise, you will, yeah. you are frustrated already. Yeah. So this is the place that you can let all the stuff that you have and out so that we can at least calm you down and give you some, some ideas that you can try. So that's yeah. it's good that you're saying it, you know? know, it's good for you and it's good for us to know what to do and how to help you. Yeah. Well, and you have made so much progress with them. I mean, they have really come around to a lot of your suggestions. I think that, um, that you know with a like diplomat like we'll find you some resources that you can take in and just say hey what would you think about playing music like not playing music for, or only playing music at lunchtime or you know or could we take a break from the music you know like could we see what would happen if we just take a like an hour break from it you know <laughs> yeah. um you know like just hey what would you think would happen like kind of just really um, like, I feel like there's a couple different ways that you could approach it. You could approach it in the moment, like where, hey, you know, I was wondering what would happen if we just didn't have any music this morning. Would you be willing to try that? Or you could go another route, which is like, hey, you know, I want to sit down and kind of talk about some concerns that I've been having. And this is what I learned in my class. And this is, you know, would you be willing to try this? Um, I think that's that's two different ways that I can think of to kind of open the door to talk to yeah. them about it. Because I think and it's also reasonable. your observation will you can share your observations that when the music is not on, the children are working with full concentration or they're working like this. But when the music is on, there are a lot of things that happens when the music is on because yeah. um, sometimes the children are working, especially in the practical life areas where there are a lot of sounds that are involved and that's their point of interest, like pouring. When they're pouring something, they're mm -hmm. actually hearing the sound of the right. grains dropping or the water pouring. So those are the things you can bring it as a rational that children are missing those part, the point of interest. Without the point of interest, the children cannot focus and their concentration will not build up. And it takes a long time for any person, you know, especially the children, to concentrate or focus on particular activity. And until unless they have full concentration, they are not going to be normalized. Mm -hmm. So when the children are having issues, uh, we are just, uh, and you express is to them that, you know, we are blaming on the children that this children is bad and this children is this. We're name, putting names on it, leveling them. But it's our fault that we are not helping them to concentrate. Talk about those things, you know, what is your aim? What are you doing? What, why are you doing it? Like well, you did write about the activity, each, yeah. activity is, each activity has a point of interest, direct aim, indirect aim, try to explain those things. And the music is not helping them to concentrate. To well, normalize. and it, it prevents the teachers from really teaching music. And that's because, so we watched, I don't know, I'm going to say 40 minutes of um, Terry and Kathy who have beautiful voices who I lo like, but seriously, I will tell you, though, that any of the songs that they sing, you're not going to use those in your circle time. Um, maybe a couple, but those are not circle time songs. Those are points of interest songs. Those are songs that you use to connect the child to, to orient them, first of all, right? Because those are traditional songs, and part of our job is to orient the child to the place and time in which they live. And those are the songs, those are, that's like our Americana. Those are our traditional songs. Those are the child's birthright to teach those songs to them. They, we are obligated to 
um, to connect them to that. If there is always music playing, we cannot take that responsibility. We are interrupting the cultural transmission of our traditional songs, and that's not okay. Also, <laughs> The, um, we have, like, when you have music playing all the time, it prevents you from exercising one of the most powerful tools that we have, which is our singing voice. And I read a few, Casey had something on the discussion board, M many of you referenced this, that when you sing, Laura, you just talked about it, it really draws attention in a way that um, is critical. So you sing during transitions, you sing um, to connect the child to their culture, to their place and time. And when there's music playing all the time, we can't do that. And, um, and, and we wanna do that. That's part of our job. Um, so all of the songs that, um, that we learned are great songs and they're important songs. They're not even all the songs, um, but they're not songs that we're going to use a lot during circle time. Those are songs, you know, we'll use a couple of them, but like when you have songs during circle time, they have to have actions. They have to draw the ch the toddler in. The toddler's not going to stay with you for more than one of those <laughs> songs. They're not, because there's no part for them except to listen. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> okay, I'll pause. I'll take a breath there. <laughs> I did have an aha moment um, listening to their songs when they were talking about vocal warm ups and the animal sounds. Yeah. I have one little boy who the last couple weeks has been using an outside voice like consistently inside. And um, there has been very, you know, few things that have directed him away from that. You know, obviously it doesn't work to say, please use the inside voice. Um, but he loved, we did the animal sounds as, as a group um, during circle time. And we, I alternated between loud animal sounds and um, quiet animal sounds like a mouse. And, um, and I, I could, I could get him to make, loud noises and soft noises um, together as a group. And, um, and he, that seemed to sort of satiate his need for that for a while. Um, it was like an hour or two before he was using his outside voice again. So um, that was really helpful. I hadn't tried that. <laughs> awesome. Um, and Kathy, please keep trying. I know you will be successful. I mean, in the beginning, it's always hard for anybody to make get understand what it, what you want to say, but keep saying it, repeating it, and then you will be successful. I be, I, I I'm sure you will. Yeah. Do they turn I, the music I, off during um, circle time? Like what? How, like how? Or do you have to just compete with the music on the on the radio? Off at circle time and at nap time. They turn it off at those times. Yeah. That seems crazy to me. They won't. The, if the chil if the children spontaneously start singing at lunchtime, they stop them. If the if they stop, if they start spontaneously doing anything, they just everything is really structured. Like circle time is structured. They have to sit still. They mm -hmm. all have to come to circle. Time. They're, they're running it like a traditional system. Yeah. I know. Do any it's, of them have so their send them, send them to us. The training? <laughs> send them to us for the training. They yeah, I was training. wondering, do any of them have training? Because honestly, to, if they don't, to sort of speak in their defense a little, just coming from someone who worked for so long in a free environment without the training, like I always just did things because that's the way the teacher before me did them. Like, and I was just like shooting in the dark when putting out materials and just like, well, this is the age range, so this is what they should do. And, and I'm coming to find that it's so not right, you know, like, but you have to learn this to realize it. Right. Well, or maybe those teachers are uh, primary teachers. Now the, the director had infant toddler training over 35 years ago. Okay. The lead teacher learned from her. Uh, lead teacher has training through Canada through binding. There's no online or anything. It's not accredited. Yeah. Not accredited. 
And then the other teacher that comes in to help, she's a three to six. Yeah, that's right. Somebody really must be a primary teacher. That's why they have to sit. Yeah. yeah there's really no I don't even think the well, it's funny when you when I when I observe the three to six, they're doing things that the toddlers should have been doing, you know, and she's they're more Montessori structured in that area than the toddler area is. So, so, so what they are doing, what toddlers are doing, because of maybe because of the children's developmental level, sometimes even in elementary we repeated some of the activities that they were doing in the primary because the children were not ready. Uh, so developmentally, they are in that stage. So we have to start from there. And, and always it's well, and, and I would assume. Such a loss. The, the, the infants and toddlers, they're there where they, they can learn. But it's just such missed opportunities. And mm -hmm. now they're getting ready to move on to the pre-primary class. So it's, that's kind of why I feel a little sad because things that I know they could have learned in that class, they just haven't. So yeah. We're moving on now. So. You know, I, have, I had a similar experience this year, Kathy, and um, I had a lot of, as you guys all know, I had a lot of conflict with my my lead teacher who's not Montessori trained and I, I had a lot of the same feelings as you Kathy and, and feeling frustrated and um, and really concerned for the children and, and making sure that they're getting their needs met um, but I, I, think, I think somewhere in the process I decided to just meet that teacher where she is and um, and it wasn't gonna go from zero to a hundred you know that we were just gonna take small steps and um, you know, I think we're finally to the point where uh, the classroom is is much more Montessori than it was, um, but it's not perfect. And I guess I realized how sort of emotionally connected she was to what she was doing. You know, even though what she was doing is not consistent with what I'm learning, you know, she really believed in what she was doing. And and for me to uh, to challenge that, even though I was trying to be really diplomatic. You know that that was that was hard for you. I mean, hard for her. So I think it, it's a difficult position for you um, to yeah. be in. And I think everybody's given great suggestions. And but um, you know, it's it's probably not going to change um, overnight. Just a slow, you know, progress. And um, and and I I found that I really had a lot to learn from this teacher, even though. Um, there was a lot that she wasn't doing. Um, she's really talented at following the child and um, really perceptive uh, with children. So I, I tried to find things that I thought, I thought they did well and not, not so much things they were overlooking. Um, although, you know, I made note of those things. <laughs> so, but I wish you luck. Yeah, yeah me too. The I know. Is open. Um, her two assistants. You can <clears throat> feel the, the resistance and almost animosity towards me. If I try to just suggest anything, the lead teacher will go along and then she'll try to bring them in and they won't do it. And so then she'll back away. So it's like, I, wanna, I don't want to uh, rock the boat. You know, I don't want her job to be any. Well, any that's okay. You could, that's her job though. <laughs> I mean, that's why you're the lead. You know, it's, you got to take the good with the bad. When you're in charge, then you get to be in charge and it gets to be the way that you want it. But also you have to take responsibility for the fact that you have other people, you know, that you're managing and they have needs too. So it's part of her job to, um, to deal with, you know, with this, especially because what you're advocating for is a consistent, a consistency with the pedagogy if the assistants are advocating like they don't want things to change because people don't like change and also because it's easier for them like mm -hmm. you know it's easier for you obviously to change a plastic diaper than it is to work with children on potty training it's all it's easier for you to tie somebody's shoe than to slow down and show them how to do it you know it's easier for you to dress them like those are that's 
you know, that, I mean, so. And I, I feel like when someone comes into the environment that hasn't been there before and know more than you, it's very threatening to like yeah. your job security. It makes you worry. You know, it's that, so oh, sad man. though <laughs> that, that that's the well, attitude. Like why can't like the rising sh like tide lift all boats, you know, like why, like I feel like I, I get what you're saying. And I think that um, that is like, I don't, I don't want to say it's human nature, but that's a um, definitely, definitely people feel that way. I'm just lamenting um, like, why can't, you know, our motto in our school is teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> Um, we're all on the same side and that's the side of the kids. So there it doesn't, there just doesn't need to be, I don't know, <laughs> all that. It's unfortunate. What does Casey think about it? What do you think, Casey? What, what, do, you think? <laughs> what do you think about, about this? What the, about about the situation that Kathy is facing? Um... I think a lot of things. I think I can totally relate to how you're feeling. Um, and I, I want to kind of, you know, mirror what Debika was saying. You know, this is the place where you can feel free to vent all you want. I think all of us have, have done that. And I think it's, it's great that we have that refuge here. Um, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I know too what Laura's saying. It does feel threatening, like, especially for me, you know, like, and, and I would imagine you guys too, who were just, you know, kind of newbies in this situation and still learning the ropes and trying to make a change for the better. And you don't have someone who's, you know, completely, you know, on your side. It, it's, it, you feel like, kind of helpless and hopeless and it's not fun. And I'm sorry that you're going through that, but I have faith in you. I can see your passion. I think you're you're on the right track. You're gonna go places. Well and what will happen? What will happen to the children, right? Like <laughs> no offense, but they need you. <laughs> so the children, right? <laughs> No guilt. No, no. Who actually? No let me let me ask you the question in a different way. Now, who owns the problem? Who owns the problem? I do. Yeah. You do. Then it's hard to solve. Yeah. In a Montessori classroom, you always have to think who owns the problem. Children owns the problem. They are having the difficulty, most difficulties. And they're showing it in the classroom. And that's what you have to find it, that how they're showing their problems. Because ownership of the problem is theirs. They're the sufferer, not you or me. Chris, do you have anything to say about it? <laughs> Your hair looks really cute, Chris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that's a tough position. I guess I would try to, I mean, I've been in that position where I've had a director that was going through the Montessori training. I was in a three to six year old classroom. So I, um, I was the lead teacher and then she was brought in as the director and she went through training. So I was her mentoring teacher as she was going as she was doing the training and I was underneath her. So it was awkward and she didn't agree with some of the things, but, but, um, you know, best, I mean, trying to give them the knowledge to, or, you know, that we are getting right now and saying, there's something really exciting. I learned in my class today or, I share a lot of the videos. I don't know if I'm supposed to <laughs> um, with my with my teacher or with my assistant, and and I always do that. And I'm like, look at uh, this lady was talking about this, and it makes so much sense. Let's change it and see if we can, you know. But I'm the lead teacher in my classroom too, so you're in a tough position. It is. I mean, how about how about Wendy? What do you think about it? 
I was just thinking. Um, who owns the problem? That was my question. Oh, who owns the problem? Sorry, I didn't answer the question. <laughs> That's okay. I got some. Well, the, people, the children own the problem, and you're right, but they don't even know that there is a problem. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, hmm. but they don't. They don't know what is what is the problem, but they show it in their actions. And we are there to observe that part. And if I were you, Kathy, what I would do, I would have a meeting with my administrator and just ask for two or three days to run the classroom the way you are learning from us. And you can ask that all these times the music was on and I did all these observations and I have all the records and now I'm going to observe these children, same children give me three days to observe without the music and I will play the music when I feel like it is appropriate according to my training and I'll do that and I will even you can videotape that and show it to the administrator that this is what I observed when the music was on and this is what I observed when the music was not on. Mm -hmm. It was on, but when, it, when you felt that this should be the music time and show her the, your, all the uh, records and then put the ball in her court and say, what do you think? Do you think the children are functioning the way it should be or you see any difference? Because actually, it's not you. It's you. You are getting frustrated because your children are having difficult. Am I right? Yeah. 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 So you are concerned about the children. So let us record their reactions and how they are functioning in the classroom. How much concentrating they are. How much they are talking and just wandering around. Are they doing actual work, purposeful activities? That is our goal in a Montessori classroom. Those are the things you need to observe and then sit down with the administrator. Even you can have a team meeting and show them the videos. This is what I did. And thank you for giving me these three days to run the classroom the way I learn. So that way, I think that that will be the best way you can try. Instead of going into argument or any conflicting situation, because what they believe, they believe, because that's, and you respect their beliefs, but you cannot function like that. You think that's not the right way to run a Montessori classroom. So try to do it that way and see what works best. And I, I, I'm sure the director will, she will want the best for the children, right? Bye. Well, you'll have to keep us updated. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard. Um, well, uh, I'm sorry. I couldn't find my headphones. These are bends and the little bulb is too big. I think we're actually, we couldn't hear you. So maybe some of you put your, hey. you okay? yeah. you can hear us, but we yes, can, I, I can, can hear you. Yes. Oh, now I can hear you. Ruby, no more. Um, so one of the prompts that didn't get answered on the discussion board was about the whole body development. Did you guys look at the at that one? Like why do we seem to prioritize um like cognitive, like academic development over physical development? And um what's the error in that kind of thinking? <laughs> it seems more it seems like it's more easily measured and assigned a number uh, you can like quantify I yeah. feel like I feel like yeah. yeah you can more easily assess it and test it and right and I think we value the accumulation of knowledge as a culture and we don't place as much value on um well, I mean, some, I mean, we have professional athletes, so obviously we place some value on physical they ability. They make a lot of money, but that's too. In, but, that's in re, but that's in regards to, like, entertainment as well. Like, they're entertaining us, and that's why we appreciate it. But, like, I, I, I guess you could sort of take 
I don't know, I guess the idea of farming hits close to home for me because I grew up on a farm, my husband farms, like the idea of the physical um, exertion and, you know, ability that it takes to do that kind of work is not exactly respected. And so I think in general, we sort of downplay the importance of that sort of aspect of life and it only makes sense that then we wouldn't see the development always as important unless it starts to interfere with someone's ability to develop cognitively as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that's really sad that we, I, I was thinking the same thing that we don't ever pay attention to the physical unless it's causing a problem. And then we're like, Oh yeah. Which is really sad. We shouldn't do that. But, but I, I know. think it's also not seen as something that we can teach. Yeah. So it's just something that happens. Like but, natural ability. And we don't, yeah, and we don't realize how important and lucky we are that it does happen naturally until it's not happening naturally. Yeah. But it won't happen naturally unless we provide the proper environment for it to happen. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a double edged sword. Right. <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting too. I see you, Casey, like the, there's this whole like music and movement. And when I, I mean, and when I think of movement or music, like I thinking, I think about, and this is from my music together training, this idea that children um, are developing primary musical competence. And there's two components to that. One is tonal competence and the other is rhythmic competence. Mm -hmm. And just like um, Montessori, like in music together, they believe that, um, well, children are limited by their biological capacity, but um, also, so some children are more predisposed to rhythmic and music or um, music competence than others because of their genetics. Mm -hmm. But with the correct, um, you know, um, environment and teaching, all children can develop that tonal and rhythmic competence. And so when I think about music and movement, I think about music and rhythm. Rhythm And rhythm is something that is like so, I mean, it's, it goes back, like it's the beating heart in utero. And that um, as a people, we evolved um, beating drums. And, you know, those are part of our ceremonies and part of our rituals. And, and through that, we develop this competence with rhythm and, um, and so that's, you know, a little bit separate than tonal competence. And so those are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about when you're doing your circle time. Like, in what way am I supporting tonal competence? In what way am I supporting rhythmic competence? And um, with the toddlers, one of the things that I do with them, and people have said that I'm crazy, but I disagree um or maybe I am but uh <laughs> but I we use rhythm sticks <laughs> and you show them you know the rhythm sticks need space you got to be careful with them you have to sit down when you play them and we clack out um I sing a song with them called hey 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 what do you say let's all clack our sticks today and then um they, we click them like, you know, working on the railroad. We click them like we ride bicycles. We roll them out like lasagna. So you can go through and lead them through these different rhythm games, show them ready position. I'll take a video for you guys. I know I keep promising you videos, but I seriously, it'll happen. <laughs> and you can kind of see, um, but the, you know, and then um, you can do echo, rhythm echoes, you know. So I, even with the toddlers, and I know Frank Lido said, don't do the echo with the toddlers. And I love that guy. And he's right about everything except for that. Like you do need your staff to, right? They can echo. They can do it. Um, you do need your, your support staff to echo for you. But, um, but I always tell them, um, be my echo. Be my echo. Everything I sing. Everything I sing. <laughs> repeat after me. Repeat after me. And you can do rhythm, ba, 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 ba. And even though they're not gonna echo totally, we can do, we can turn our whole bodies into um, instruments. So those are the kinds of um, little, that you're probably already incorporating into your circle. But and these are the preparation for actually reading. 
the rhythm is the uh, preparation for uh, it's it's an indirect aim for the reading skill rhythm and um oh uh, yeah following patterns and everything following mm -hmm. patterns yeah syllables and you know three three letter words four letter words yeah. you know all those things those are the it gives the rhythm um helps them to develop so well and it's also music is a language too and when you're yes. doing like the um ta ta ti ti ta to yeah. to yeah. yeah. you're introducing children to the language of of music and the language of rhythm mm -hmm. um yeah. and so then they'll start to um and you can do the solfeggio with them I recommend that everybody get a, a pitch pipe. Um, they're like $8 and then you blow the middle C one of the thing. And then, and then everybody can start in key. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so you start, you know, but, but I show the children, put your hands on your belly and take a big belly breath and let's do our warm ups, And we do the do re mi mm -hmm. scale. And that's a, um, you know, they're, as long as the children have something, some part to play, like that they have something to do, even if it's just holding a shaker, then you'll keep them engaged. And um, mm -hmm. when we introduce songs, we want to make sure that we're giving the ear like a little like flavor, a little spice. And so we want to make sure that we're not like all in um, hit, that every song is, isn't the same um, for four time. So like, you know, looking at, um, waltzes like the waltzing matilda is a good example of something that's not in four four um dolce 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 um dolce mi mama <laughs> that's another one that's not it's that's not a four four time and it's a interesting the point of interest in that song is the funny measure at the end right is that yeah. how you sing it with um with your kids dolce. And we um, it changes rhythm through the song. It changes rhythm. Uh -huh. You have to listen uh, for what rhythm it is. Yeah, and then they like the chicky cha, chicky part cha, where they chicky dance. cha. <laughs> and um, the way that Matil, I I've just yeah, posted, yeah. but the way that she showed us was like ha she had like these funny hand motions that she did. She was great, and I swear, like those songs were handed down from like um, Moses directly to this one, like not really, but she like they were songs that I had never heard before. Um, that just came through playgrounds and streets of, you know, children playing. And um, it was so exciting that they're still, that's not happening. Like kids don't go out and play um, after school on the street and teach each other songs and sing like jump rope, Cinderella, dressed in yellow, went upstairs to kiss a fella. Like those are um, like, nobody does that anymore. Um, and I don't know. I don't know whether it's, I, if I, there's a value judgment there, but um, it feels like we're disconnecting from our um, our musical heritage. You can't play jump rope over text. No, I know. Yeah, I was just thinking <laughs> the age group that could go out and do that without parental supervision yeah. is on their phones and their tablets and watching TV instead. Yeah. I used to love so. Chinese jump rope and all the that was so fun to me, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think in some places it still lives and um, like certainly in our classrooms, but that's, you know, Montessori didn't want specialists in the classroom. Like she didn't want like music specialists in the classroom. Um, but there was a different expectation um, culturally during that time. Like every house had a piano. Um, someone you knew you knew how to play chances are you knew how to play the piano um, if you were a teacher and so Montessori thought well we don't need specialists because um, everybody brings with them you know a fair amount of um, competence already with music and that's just not the case anymore and we've like willingly abdicated our power like um, and told professionals that they you know like we leave it to the professionals nobody wants to sing anymore you know that's for those are for professionals that's that's why you know you put on a cd because that's the professionals singing yes. you know who am i to sing um <laughs> i mean really like i think i really i i i believe this and um so 
you know, it's part of our task and our obligation is to really like stoke those fires and keep them burning. Um, and so one of the things that I was going to have you do in this session, and it's just going to be like a reflection maybe is think about like what your relationship is to music and how you feel when you sing and really like unpack that and try to, if there's any like hesitation there, you gotta try to move through it if just only for the time that you're at school because the children need you to sing to them. They need to hear you. Regardless of how good you think you sound. <laughs> I, think, uh -oh. I don't know if anybody feels this way, but I feel like singing calms me down. Like. I feel like it's it's a, like a meditation or, or soothing to me. Like I, I guess it slows my breathing down, so it helps me calm it's, down. <laughs> Dude, I feel that way too. My, is my life my passion? So like I bring my ukulele in, and I'll like I feel like it's become a problem because I just like rock out. <laughs> like I was, playing, I was playing Hotel California the other day, and my gosh, <laughs> like. I mean, I, and like, I'm not like, you know, rocking. I'm just like playing and I, I, I love it. I dig music a lot and I love putting it in my room. And so, okay, we also did, um, we had to called Lunch on the Lawn and it was like the last day of school, you know, the school year. And all the parents come and they, they pack a lunch. We have a picnic on the lawn and we, uh, each class had a couple songs that we, you know, practiced over the past handful of months. And then at the end, we all get together, the toddlers and the um, preschooler, you know, the three to sixers, and we sang uh, the, um, oh, the Hawaiian dude, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It was, was amazing, nice. by the way. Thank you. I know. I'm so proud of it. <laughs> um, but then uh, the other song that my, that my Todd, we sang uh, with a little help from my friends, the Joe Cocker version. Oh, I'm like, nice. Because we get by with a little help from our friends, and yeah, it's so cute. And like uh, my my boss, her classroom, they sang "Sweet Child of Mine," you know, and <laughs> and they, like that Cat Stevens song, "If You Want to Hang Out, Hang Out." Like, like I get, I'm getting. You can tell I'm getting passionate about it. Like, there's so much good music that's out there that cannot die, and I feel like it's dying. And I'm not on my watch. <laughs> It will not die. Not on our watch. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, sorry. Oh, no, I'm, I'm so glad. That, you know, in the ukulele, not to diminish, you know, your talent or whatever. Actually, I try not to um, use the word talent. Like, I think that we, you got to work, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, and that's how you get good. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, not to diminish your hard work, but the ukulele was named by the Guinness Book of World Records as the easiest instrument to play. And um, I did pick it up after I already knew how to play the guitar, but it's a very, it is very easy. And I've taught a lot of people how to play it. And I'll send you a link to a YouTube video. So like, if you ever were like, I, I want to play the ukulele, but I just don't think that I could. Let me tell you, you can. And um, it's Especially like spend the $40 you know on the ukulele. What's that? Say it again. Especially if you know a little bit of guitar anyway, because a lot of the chords translate. Like the shapes, the shapes. are the same. Yeah, the shapes. Yeah. Um, but I like, it's it's hard for my old brain. But um, that's why I'm not going to get Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> so... <laughs> Because it, it has to work really hard. <laughs> I better um, go out and have a ukulele. <laughs> <clears throat> I really encourage you to buy a ukulele. You will not regret it. And I'll send you some links um, to, there's a gal, her name's Cynthia Lim, and she's adorable. She always wears a little, like, orchid in her hair and um, does, like, the Hawaiian ukulele. Um, and you'll be singing uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight in no time with her. She'll be <laughs> great. <laughs> well, that'll be one of my goals song. for... That'll be one of my goals for 2019 when my brain has more time. <laughs> totally. All right. Well, it's 6.35, so I'll uh, – hey, have a good break next week. I'll see you guys in two weeks. See ya. Okay. Bye. I hope that you feel better. Bye. 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 Bye, guys.